I briefly got to meet each of y'all. My name is Matthew. I've been a Geekdom member probably for about six, seven years right out of school. Um, before COVID, I would be in this role in a lot of different ways. It was my way of kind of being one of the youngest in the room, learning from the entrepreneurs that are building the businesses. So I'm very excited to learn each of y'all's story. And I think some of my curiosity may take some of the questions a little off, off what Jay gave us, but we'll try to keep it um, as simple, the questions as simple and related to everything y'all are doing as possible. Um, I guess from my perspective, I would just say that there's no um, specific way questions have to be answered. You know, don't feel intimidated. Just kind of be yourself. And I think naturally all of y'all's story, even just overhearing y'all talk to each other, I think it'll make for it worthwhile uh, for the down market to share. Uh, so I'll go ahead and pass it over to each of y'all. We could start with introductions and then we'll kind of go from there. Yeah, so I'm Melvin Eckhart. I'm a coach, creative, and entrepreneur in the making and I was raised here in San Antonio, Texas. My name is Chastity Morales. I am a current entrepreneur. Um, I own uh, gym spaces throughout San Antonio and I used to be a professional athlete, born and raised San Antonio and hoping to build a community at home. And I'm Michael LaHood. I am a former professional athlete, used to play professional soccer and retired here in San Antonio. Uh, San Antonio really has become home for me and it's, it's a unique place to kind of start this next chapter of my life. So today's conversation is all about health, wellness related to entrepreneurship and uh, the the lessons in, in both sports and business that each of y'all have learned. So I'd, I'd love to kind of start with um, each of y'all was an athlete before being an entrepreneur or creative. Let's start there. How, how, what was the sport you played? How'd you get into it? You know, years later, you're still in the industry in a lot of different ways. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I used to play women's professional football. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean like actual tackle ball, like not, like like, real like, like not soccer. So I yeah. <laughs> played soccer for a long time, yeah. but I actually, you know, I played uh, arena bowl. So very aggressive sport, um, seven on seven, very quick on a 50 yard field, indoor. So I always, I always say this because I'm like, if you Google me, you know, just be prepared. Um, <laughs> so I used to play for, for a league called the LFL and it used to be called the Laundry Football League. Later yep. on the line, they actually changed it to the Legends Football League. Um, they got a little cleaner with the uniforms, which was nice, but then they started to really acquire like top talent and top athletes. And, um, you know, growing up, women don't really have the, the opportunity to be able to play football. You know, now it's kind of starting to take a bit more of a change. So you have women from all different like walks of life and all different sports, whether it's from cheerleading, basketball, track, every, every shape and size, um, kind of coming together to try out for a league that people kind of tend to deem, but it's got some shine, but it's also got some, some shadow, yeah. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. sure. gotcha. um, but I played that for about, about five or six years. Absolutely loved it. It was fun, especially kind of within my 20s. Yeah. Um, crazy transition in my life. I've, I've always been a, a, a big advocate for sports. I played soccer, like I said, but this was just a completely different avenue where I was actually being showcased and promoted and marketed. So that was just a whole different whole different world for me. Um, I was a wide receiver, hey. so a little showboat, like for sure I was <laughs> out there. I can scoring. see, who was your inspiration at wide receiver? Oh man, if there's, I was a big Deshaun Jackson fan. I'm, a, I'm an Eagles okay. fan, so yeah, if you're yeah. a Cowboys fan, oh, I apologize. No ah. I apologize. No hate, I promise you. <laughs> All it's love. just how I grew up. Yeah. I mean, my dad would literally have us watch every Sunday. Like that was like our downtime. That's cool. And he'd be like, All right, we're gonna spend time together. Come sit down and watch football with me. And it's like, I'm a girl at the time. I'm a soccer player, like a kid. I'm like, I'm gonna watch football. And then later ended up growing into a professional player. <laughs> but um, I was actually really inspired by that. And I loved Deshaun Jackson just because he was kind of like a, it was kind of rude, but at the same time, yeah. he was an incredible athlete, yeah. and he was always the smallest person on the field. So, being skinny and quick and everything like that kind of gave me some type of inspiration to say, well, I mean, if if he, I don't need to be a big, bulky woman. I mean, I, I like my athletic build, but I can still go out there and make an impact. Yeah. Um, and I actually like the praise of being a wide receiver. Like, I'm, I want to be that person that catches all the touchdowns, and that's, you know, getting in people's face in the end zone or dancing and doing all that stuff. So. I uh, did that for a little while and then actually had a career ending injury. I, I tore my ACL, but it was honestly like bleeding right into me becoming an entrepreneur. So um, it happened legit at the right time. And it was probably one of the best things that could have happened to me because I legit was gonna continue to keep playing because it's really hard to get away from the game as you guys probably know, it's your whole life. So I think the universe and God or whatever that case may be just said, it's gonna take this to pretty much get you out. So zap me right on my knee. <laughs> and like I said, you're out for a little while. So, but like I said, it was, it, whatever happened was meant to happen. And yeah. here we are now. Yeah, that's good. Rock, paper, scissors. We can rock, paper, <laughs> we, we, can we can do it, it right now. All right, one, one and done. All right. Call it. All right. One, two, three, shoot. Yeah. 
I knew you was gonna do that. <laughs> I felt it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was like, last minute, I know I'm going paper. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so uh, yeah, track and field was uh, my, my professional sport. I did it for seven years. Went to Texas A&M, had a lot of success. Met my wife there, multiple national championships, multiple All-American honors, and uh, really the transition into professional sport happened kind of challenging. So as soon as I graduated from college, found out my girlfriend, now wife, was pregnant. So it kind of threw a, threw a monkey wrench in my plans. Yeah. I was slated to move out to California, train at the Olympic Training Center, and had all these things lined up, and then boom, life happens. And so I really knew what it was like to have a good father, so I wanted to be that. And so really kind of repositioned, figured out what family looks like. And then two years later, got back into sport. It was a beautiful uh, transition because I got in contact with my college coach and then he got me in contact with his mentor and he was still coaching and that's what took me out to Phoenix. And that's where everything really began uh, when I moved out to Phoenix in 2014 and uh, signed with a major brand out there and, and really got to travel the world, uh, broke the top 50 in the world as a, as a long jumper and really got to fulfill everything that I wanted to fulfill. And I think sometimes in entrepreneurship, it's so easy when you are an athlete or you've been signed to a major brand or you've done campaign work, you've been seen, that that somehow becomes entrepreneurship. And I think I kind of fell into that a little bit as well. And now being now in my 30s, removed from sport, having retired, I now recognize that it's okay to be becoming. Mm -hmm. Like you don't have wow. to be. And so often I feel like people, specifically in the entrepreneurial pool, is like, hey, what can I project? And I got a lot of things I can project, but I'd rather be becoming because it's more humble and it actually gives me some steps. So that's why I love sitting up here. You guys have, a, you know, established entrepreneurial, you know, vision and things that y'all are doing. And there's things in my lane that I'm doing as well. But I think that it gives a nice, I don't want to say juxtaposition, but it gives some texture to the conversation of like, hey, the becoming needs to be talked about a little bit more because I see yeah. a lot of projection yeah. and no one knows how to own the process. So, yeah. Quick question, what was your longest jump? Mm. 20, so I, I'm on the metric system in, in jumps. It's crazy right. because like, I grew up here in America. In high school, everything's feet and inches. Mm -hmm. Then when you go to college and then professional, yeah. everything's metric. So it's like actually hard for me to <laughs> like go back. It's yeah. crazy. So my furthest jump was 816, mm -hmm. uh, which is 26 feet 10 inches, I believe. Oh, holy so uh, <laughs> the, the thing about track and field, I, I know y'all are both somewhat familiar, yeah. is that there's so many highs and lows. It's the people that are consistent that actually break through on the international stage. But yeah, my best jump was the best jump for a reason. So I jumped around 26 feet a lot. I had that big that big jump that kind of propelled me. Uh, but man, it's tough to stay at your mm, top. But yeah, shoot, uh, I know. it's tough, but yeah, 26 10. I, yeah, I would only bring this up because it, it played a big part of my life. So the, one of my mentors, uh, was in track and field and she should high jump and long jump. Yeah, and so so much of what you're describing comes back in the, some of the stories she was telling But yeah. especially what you just said about yeah. it's so hard to stay at the top mm -hmm. um, I think that that pressure cooker feeling and, and she made she went to two Olympics Yeah, and oh. it was that feeling of anticipation of this is this is your Olympics This is your right. moment to shine and break through and get to this new stratosphere so that, like, thank you for sharing, because it really takes me back to being in her office. She's a sports psychologist now. Yeah. But being in her office and hearing her story, and it, it just, it gives it relevancy and it, it gives it a face and someone who can relate. So right. I wanted to definitely say that. Well, last but not least. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the champion of yeah. Here we go. Now, um, so like I said before, I, soccer, soccer was my first love. Mm. And I, I didn't realize that until going through the process of becoming. I love how you said that yeah. because a year ago, and I'm still in that process of becoming and taking one foot into the process of I am. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it, in my introduction to remember, oh, I'm a sports broadcaster mm -hmm. and also an entrepreneur. I'm, yeah. I am doing these things right. I set out to do. Uh, that's a constant reminder and a constant thing I'm still working on growing in. Yeah. But I remember coming to San Antonio in 2019 and soccer taking me around the world, like you said, and soccer is my first love because I moved from Africa and it was the only thing I'd ever known that was consistent. It, mm. it felt like it never betrayed me. It, it, it would never leave you. It, it was always there. If right. you were kind to it and good to it, it would be good to you. Mm. And it was so ingrained in me and it was such a big part of my identity. And when the world stopped, I started 
feeling this calling of something else. And the unique thing is it took place here at Geekdom. Mm. So coming back into Geekdom a year removed and seeing, I'm gonna give her a shout, seeing Ashley over there um, it, and meeting different people and connecting to a community, it, it was so odd to, to like make friends of who am I without this thing. Yeah. And so when I was told through the self-reflection self process that I think you're gonna be a good entrepreneur, I almost laughed. Cause I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> I, I was meant to kick the ball. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to work for someone. Yeah. And it's been really unique. Here's where I found out that my dream and passion for broadcasting, it, it was born here yeah. at Geekdom. So it's it just been a year removed, finishing up my last broadcast of the year and actually calling it here in San Antonio remote. Um, it's unique in that process of taking time to pause and reflect and look at, we talked about it before this, looking at the road that you've traveled and like, wow, like everything is happening as it should. And I'm stepping into this new stratosphere of being an entrepreneur and the call of that is, is still strong within while I'm also working for a corporation. So I have since transitioned into, you know, I'm a broadcaster and uh, color analyst for Austin FC up in Austin. Yep. So doing the commuter life, <laughs> but choosing to live here in San Antonio right. for a reason. And then also I, I work for ESPN and do remote broadcasts for them doing college soccer. Um, but the call of entrepreneurship is, there's something about that. It's like the call of the wild. Right. You know, that I feel like it's still, it's still gnawing at me and pulling me in a different direction. You touched on something that I, I just kind of want to expand on specifically around like that identity being wrapped in sport. And it's yeah. so crazy because I think in entrepreneurship, it can be the same thing. It can become an identity that you want to have so close to you that it at times can become toxic. Mm -hmm. And it makes you very unaware of what's starving around your life because you're just trying to feed that. Everybody understands that in sport. Oh, sure. And it's like glorifying in sport though. It's yeah. like, oh, you're working hard, you're putting in the hours. And I think about even my professional journey of how much time I sacrificed, like how much I gave to not actually be an Olympian. So my wife is a 2008 Olympian. We had our first child in 2012, but she found out in 2011. So she retired and she was like, I'm good. I've done what I came to do. Yeah. Caribbean girl, one of 10 kids. She's like a fighter. She's, she's yeah. crazy, but like she had done the dream. And so for me, it was like, it's my turn. And so all of this commitment while I'm growing a family and I started, to, when I look back, I'm like, sheesh, yeah. priorities maybe <laughs> not always intact, but yeah. it's glorified. And I think often as an athlete, we're kind of put into a position yeah. and it's isolating, right? And we think leadership mm. is lonely and all this, this, this kind of like we're up here, yeah. but it often doesn't give you the, the perspective that you need to make healthy decisions. Right. Yeah. And so even in that transition, it's really neat that you said you're becoming what I am. And it's like, but that doesn't have to have a grip on yeah. who you are. Like the identity thing, I think more rooting it in the self as opposed to what I can do yeah. is where I'm really becoming, where I'm starting to learn because I'm still, Oh, Melvin, the doo limit. Oh, Melvin, the one that, oh, I saw you all these campaigns. Oh, yeah. oh I saw, you went, you traveled over here to go. It's like, that's cool. Like, I don't ever need to downplay who I am, but it's also this idea of like, that's not all of me. Mm. And I think that I'm becoming more of an entrepreneur by owning like, who is Melvin outside of the things that he can do. Well, what's interesting, each of y'all touched on is the transition. So from going to an athlete to being in the business world, I'd love for y'all to talk a little bit more about that. What's that like if you're in the midst of it right now? Yeah. Mm. Uh, uh, I, well, I think Ooh, you have a go. really good perspective here we on go. it. Here we go. You know? um, I mean, to be honest, being an athlete, like it's kind of how they touched on a little bit. You are so solely focused on one mission that it kind of closes your mind to a lot of outside perspectives and, and to be open-minded about a lot of those things. So the transition for me was, was a little bit hard. Um, mm. I was so involved in, in being a face and just being athletic and, and working within a sport. but. When I started to go into business, I really had a lot of the same properties that I had as being an athlete transition into business, some positive, some negative, right? I was very unaware of like what business was like. I had never, I had never really worked in one, let's just be honest. Yeah. Um, I come from a dentistry background, so I was actually going to be going into like more of like the, the dental field, and then I went straight into becoming an athlete. Um, so when it came down to like the nitty-gritty of being an entrepreneur, I looked at it as more of a fact of, okay, if I'm wanting to open up a business, I'm going to try to take this one play and go for something that I believe in. So I bought into a franchise, you know, so I started from the ground up. It would have been completely hard for me because I had zero idea of what I was doing, but then I looked at a franchise as more of a blueprint of something I could use and potentially grow off of. 
Um, but to be honest, like the hardest part of the transition was having to deal with failure, honestly. Mm -hmm. Because now it's kind of low key me by myself. Like yes, I have a partner group, but a lot of it determined on how my my work ethic and everything with and how I perform was kind of located in this important, important piece of, of what we were trying to build because I was still in that phase of, yes, I have partners, but they were still investors in mm -hmm. what I was doing. And they were hoping that I was going to be able to deliver something that they could want to expand. And if I didn't and I failed, then all is lost and we're probably not going to go through with it. And they tell me this all the time, like, you know, they, they are very proud of the things I've been able to do, especially within the transition that I had with playing sports. Um, but that sports mindset was able to transition into my entrepreneur mindset because I just didn't want to give up. And they would constantly tell me, you're doing this wrong, you're, you're not doing this right. Like, you know what I mean? I had a lot of failures and people tell me that I just wasn't, not necessarily wasn't good enough, but it was more of a base of fix it, like figure it out. Yeah. And it's, when you're put in that perspective and you're in something that's completely new, it's either sink or swim at that point, like fight or flight. Mm. And you got to figure out how to overcome certain things and not be so hard on yourself and to a point where you give up. If you love it that much, you're not going to let it go that easy. Yeah. And for me, like that's exactly what it was. And I had a lot to prove, not only to them, but to myself that like if this is something that you want to do, like you, then you know you're going to have to work at it. And when I started, when I was playing football, that's kind of exactly what it was. I didn't know how to play football. I had never played football before. But I knew that this is something that I really want to do and put my all of my efforts into, and I want to be good at it. Yeah. I want to be the best at it. I want to be a professional at this. And with that type of mindset, I was able to transition that into becoming an entrepreneur. And I, I talk about this all the time because my business partners are very well established with humans, very well established. Attorneys, sports agents, mm. um, contractors, like everything. And I'm sitting in there in a room full of, of men who are potentially 15, 20 years older than me. And I'm sitting here with zero, like blank, just a sponge wanting to learn as much as I possibly mm. can. Um, and I was sitting in these, in these board meetings and a lot of the things, Oh, yeah. Sorry, sorry, not right now. Serious. <laughs> girl, knows. chill out, sorry, girl. Like, oh, repeat that. I'm just getting into it. Yeah. Um, she, like, for me, like, it was it was a point of me just sitting there, like, how am I going to figure this stuff out? I started Googling words they were saying that I didn't understand. Yeah. I taught myself a lot of this and I asked a lot of questions, and I got to a point where I had to put pride aside and ask for help. Not mm. even just for my business partners, but for mentors and friends and people I initially looked up to. So, doing that but also not being afraid of the failure aspect but also taking failure to heart like legit mm. to heart. like if i did it, i'm like we're not doing this again like we we're here to win like i had that that winner's mindset um and then just to be able to be able to work on a team again but this yeah. was different yeah i'm no longer playing on a team i'm playing coach so yeah. Yeah. it's the, being able to kind of go from that point of saying okay being, a, being in a team atmosphere and having to work with other individuals and still understanding that concept of if I do my job then everybody else's job gets done. Yep. Being able to transition that into becoming an entrepreneur didn't make it easy, but it, it definitely put things in a, in a solid perspective that I could understand because I was constantly playing the sport and, and I was really like much involved in that. Um, but then also understanding like, okay, if I'm gonna be going into the space of developing a team, then I have to be a good leader and I have mm. to understand what it's like to call the shots. and. That was the hardest part because being an entrepreneur and especially if you are so involved in them, you know what I mean? No, you always look at it like nobody's gonna work harder than me, nobody's gonna love this as much as I do. And right. half the time, that's having that type of mindset will limit you from being able to trust and grow because eventually you're gonna have to get to the point where you get really good at what you do and you have to teach other people and trust that they're gonna be able to do that for you. So, mm -hmm. like for me, it's transitioning from playing sports to being an entrepreneur. I really did use a lot of the same attributes that I had mm -hmm. within sports to transition to becoming yeah. a business owner. That makes sense. I was well, while you were talking. I was saying I think athletes would make the best entrepreneurs and almost yeah, the man. worst as well. Because <laughs> yeah. it's like this the resilience yeah. that you know as as an athlete. Right. Like you, yeah. you know what it's like to fail. You know what it's like to endure. You know what it's like to toil. Yeah. And you know that it, there's not going to be that many opportunities to shine. But you're ready, available, and willing to do that regardless. Specifically yeah. in the in the sport of track and field, it's like I was telling <clears throat> you are even your mentor. It's like it's yeah. very hard to stay at the top, but yet I'm putting in four to six hours every single day of training Monday through Saturday yeah. to try to make something that I never actually made. So it's like there's this understanding of endurance and you need that as an entrepreneur. But I think also that the double-edged sword is like we don't take that same mindset into business practices. It's like, well, yeah. I had to endure over here. I'm going to be winning over here. This is not nearly yeah. as hard as it was over here. 
And it's actually harder. Yeah. And it's so crazy because like through the transition for me from going from sport and, and working with like a billion dollar business, you you think that you have some things together. Yeah. And really I'm great at vision. The process is at times what's a little bit ha hazy. So like vision's big. When you got money behind you, you're like, I could do anything. Like yeah. Yeah. put me over here, put me over there, I'm ready. And you start to think that you're bigger than you are and you realize mm -hmm. that you don't have the team that you need to build. And yeah. so as soon as I got out of uh, out of sport, really the pandemic kind of kind of tabled me and, yeah. and reoriented <laughs> me to to a place where it's like it's yeah. time to retire and move into this this idea of entrepreneurship. I didn't realize how much I was lacking. There's so many gaps yeah. uh, in regards to mentorship, in regards to knowledge of the steps, in regards to how much you're going to fail, in regards to investment. When you got yeah. investment around you, you don't even recognize. Wait, I'm kind of cash low right now like yeah, yeah, yeah. the bankings is the the checks the savings ain't looking right yeah so it's i think it's such a beautiful thing i think that there's so many great components of being an athlete to entrepreneur but it's also there's a lot of opportunity and i think yeah. if you could hold on to that opportunity and allow people into that space to help you where in sport you're kind of like you're isolated i think entrepreneurship kind of brings you grounded yeah to say hey look i don't know everything i i know i'm projecting or maybe i'm not maybe you're projecting on me but i'm gonna let you know hey i actually need the help and that's so, that's like really that's encouraging like, to hear you say. I think for me, the biggest piece of advice that I can give anybody that wants to open up a business or, or go within the, the base of entrepreneurship is have a mentor and yeah. have somebody you can go to for some guidance because yeah. the road alone is lonely because, yeah. it's, you know what I mean? Not too many people have the same mindset as you or see your vision the way that you do. But when you have a mentor and you can go to somebody, whether it's a business partner, whether it's you know, a, a friend who's currently within the business, like I, mean, I have multiple friends that are entrepreneurs and those are the people I go to first because they understand, you know what I mean? Right. They've either been where, I, where I'm currently at or where I was, or they, they have the same vision of where I'm trying to be. Yep. Um, so that's has always been my biggest base of advice where people ask, well, what do you, what's your, what, what is something that you would tell somebody, like, you know, from who's starting day one? <laughs> get help. Right. <laughs> like, get a mentor, that's what you need. Yeah, you need, yeah. You need something to yourself. Help you handle a little bit. Right, I think timing. Yeah. So all three of us have something in common, quite a few things in common. The more we talk, I'm like, there's a reason. What you, why are we all here? It's showing itself. Yeah. I think the timing of when we all chose to transition, yeah. the pandemic, mm -hmm. and the seismic event that it's, it's caused a lot of negative things, but it's mm -hmm. given us three things in particular I think of. Um, it, crisis creates space for creativity, mm -hmm. innovation, yeah. and it gives you time. Because we, we all had to stay at home, we Preach. all had to rethink things, and it's also opened doors for all of us to maybe get into things that we may have not been open to, right. or available for, or the timing may have been off. I think of when I was playing in 2019, if I would have retired, no chance would I have gotten into broadcasting. I would have done coaching. And being a coach is still something that's a passion of mine, and it's a dualistic thing, coaching and doing broadcasting. But I actually didn't want to stay part of the game because I, I just I wanted to make sure that I was doing something that, that was outside of my day as a soccer player. Mm -hmm. And so to get into something so new like broadcasting, but still stay part of sports, yeah. I didn't know that that I didn't know that that was a, that was a thing you could do. Mm -hmm. And I, I could see it, but it was this thing that you had to be Tony Romo. You had to be a certain type of person or have a certain type of qualification. And one thing I'll never forget is the, hum the process of humility. Yeah. Where to transition, to be an athlete, to be such an accomplished athlete, to be a national champion, to be working towards an Olymp you know, the Olympics, yeah. to have a wife who's an Olympian, yeah. you know, to, to be a football player, to, to persevere, resiliency, to, to be an entrepreneur, to do all these things, and to then come to the doorstep of saying, oh wow, I now have to go and humble myself and step into this new arena where I don't know all the techniques. I don't know asking for help. One of the, one of the biggest things that I remember was during 2020 and the pandemic, that cry out for it's okay to not be okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now with athletes and, and really in the public arena, to talk about mental health. Mm -hmm. And with athletics, that was, I remember when I first started playing, you couldn't really talk about mental health. It was, you were deemed weak. Uh, you were deemed, no, oh, that's a distraction to, engage in that stuff because it'll take away time for your endeavors in sports. Mm -hmm. And um, a, a big thing that happened was meeting someone, a, a mentor and friend of mine, John Van Horn, mm -hmm. who I felt like I, all my great adventures around the world was with. Mm -hmm. And he 
describe for me this image of walking to a new room and the lights are off. Yeah. So as an athlete, you're used to building this world and you can see just miles and the markers. I'm gonna jump this much. Right. I'm gonna get these amount of yards, these amount of touchdowns. And for me, I'm gonna get these amount of goals, these awards, I know the lay of the land because experience teaches you that. And then you walk into this new space where you don't have any experience and the lights are off. Yeah. And so you're, you're fumbling your way, you're bumping into this room that has a dresser that's right in front of you, but you can't see it. Yeah. And then with more experience through mentorship, through just grinding and, and hustling the things that soccer, soccer, but athletics teaches you, the lights turn on just a little bit and now it's a bit hazier. So you can see and like, oh, there's the, there's the drawer right in front of me, but you're still bumping and fumbling your way a bit, um, but you're doing something. Right. And only through experience and time and persistence, mm -hmm. the same things that got you to where you're at as an athlete, those are things that I'm learning that I can bring in with me. Yeah. So my journey through transition was, okay, I wanna do broadcasting. Where do I go from here? Mm -hmm. I remember, <laughs> humility, I remember I looked at my phone and called everyone in my phone and just to announce I'm retiring. Mm -hmm. That was one of the hardest things to do because it was really announcing it to myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so coming to peace in terms with the end of the road and I'm going to do this, it's so scary. I'm leaving this part of me behind, this identity of me behind to move forward. Yeah. And then some of the opportunities that someone gives you, very humbling. Yeah. My first one was doing a podcast mm -hmm. for a group in Cincinnati called Cincy Soccer Talk. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't the most lucrative thing, but it was, do you really wanna do this? Mm -hmm. You're gonna have to grind. Mm -hmm. And then it was writing scripts, doing content creation. Once again, not the most lucrative thing at the moment. I started from that bottom and being a rookie again, but you're not, you have experience of being a rookie that a lot of people don't. Mm -hmm. And so being a rookie again, but being an experienced rookie was a whole transition. And so with this full transition into working for a team like Austin FC, into working for an organization like ESPN, another thing was working for a corporation all over again, but not being the commodity as an athlete. So that, that's a whole nother, whoa, how do I sit in an office? Um, do I sit up straight? Do I, what do I wear? Uh, athletes, we're used to wearing sweats. <laughs> Comfort, because right. you, you, your game day, your, your work suit is game day. Right. Your work suit is the big event. Right. You know, it's cleats, it's track spikes, it's pads, mm -hmm. it's a jersey, it's a uniform. And I used to joke with people all the time when I played, they'd be like, ah oh, man, you know, work week is so hard. And I'm like, man, I have to work on Sundays. <laughs> and Saturdays and Fridays, <laughs> man. Sundays. Right. You know, that's my that's work day. So yeah. it's it's really this flipping this world you know on its head and walking into this dark room analogy that over time and persistence and, and really the guidance of a mentor who tells you it's okay to not be okay with the initial jarring nature of this, but it gets better. Right. And really that sense of you're on the right path, it gets better. And timing is everything. So mm -hmm. The fact that we're here, the fact that you're sharing your story, I, it, it takes me back and it really inspires me. I think of, we're three people of color. Mm -hmm. The timing of being people of color in entrepreneurship is now. Yeah. It, and there's people who have led the way for us to get to this point, but who will step up to the mantle of the next generation? And I feel like our time as a generation, our time of people of color, right. is now to have a voice and step into entrepreneurship. Yeah, yeah. so. That's good, great imagery. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I love that. And you touched a little bit on mental health, specifically mm. with, with that transition. For the creatives and entrepreneurs listening, uh, you know, it's very easy like an athlete to overtrain and overtraining or overworking and entrepreneurship is sitting in front of a computer. How, how, how important is mental and physical health? You know, if someone's sitting here going, why? You know. It's an easy answer, but from y'all's perspective, I'd love to share more y'all's thoughts on mental health as well. I think we're starting to kind of box it a little bit. Yeah. I think that it's mm -hmm. a very powerful conversation. This idea of mental health, <clears throat> mental resilience, mental performance, it's taken on a lot of a lot of names now. Yeah. And it's a big area that I invest in. I invested in a lot of it in my professional career, really starting at around 24, 25. I recognize that I do not perform well mentally. So I'm relying on the rep sets, I'm relying on all of the physical and not a lot of the mental. And you can hide that very easily. And you see a lot of males and females that hide it. 
But now we're getting people like Simone Biles talking about it. Uh, we get Michael Phelps talking about it. And that's powerful, but it also kind of creates a silo. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it. So I'm still very much involved in the community with collegiate sports and universities. And I still see the stigma, even though there is a conversation, there's a narrative there. It's so loud yeah. that it's almost like, ooh, like it was really quiet. That's uncomfortable. Now it's really loud and it's uncomfortable. And so I really think we need to find that in-between space. There's a margin. And I really want to step into it. Honestly, some of my entrepreneurial vision mm -hmm. wants to step in the space and maybe stop coloring it as mental wellness or mental health, but yeah. more like mental mindfulness or just holistic training. Like how are we looking at the whole human and stop taking away these buzzwords because it honestly, it does trigger. It's like, oh yeah, you're a mental performance. Oh, you should go to mental performance. It's like, no, no, no. Like life is mental. Like yeah, you can yeah. get into a quiet room and your thoughts are still going. Like yeah. it, it's, I think that there needs to be kind of a shift, but I do think that it's an important conversation, right? So I think that first starting with breath, starting with mm. how are we communicating like about that. this? What are we doing? What are the small steps? We can maybe identify this big issue, but how do we start making steps towards that? And I think it just becomes more of a conversation. And I don't know if we're still having good conversations around mm. that. I feel like it's like, polars it's like really big like i couldn't make it through the olympics or it's like i don't need it it's like what's that in between ground we're like the people that kind of have it together or they feel like they're there feels a little too aggressive on one side and not enough on the other side like yeah. we got to sit in that middle ground i think that that'd be more powerful conversation i mean i can tell you right now and i'm just gonna be as like open and raw with you come on i am 1000 percent in the in the process right now trying to figure out how to mentally sustain myself, especially with the rate that we're going. Yeah. I don't know what to do. Like, I, don't yeah. Have, yeah. I have days where I'm just like, and I'll tell myself, I'm like, mm. there's something wrong. Like, just don't, I don't feel right. I don't know yeah. what it is. And I like the fact that you said it's being glorified because, yeah, people can give you multiple steps on what it's going to take to sustain your mental health or to be okay. Like, right. Breath work, I think, is, is great. Like, I'm right. actually, I actually have comfort in that because right. it's something that slows me down. Right. But for me, I'm still trying to figure out, like, is it the meditation? Is it mm -hmm. music? Is it what I'm eating? Like, I'm still trying to figure it out. And it, I, that actually stresses me out yeah, but, because the status mm -hmm. quo right now is people currently telling you what it takes to be mentally healthy. In my opinion, that's changing so damn much that it's hard to keep up with. Big facts. And for me, like my 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 mental escape has always been exercise. That's yeah. why I'm so passionate about what I do because yes, I can I can get myself in great physical shape and I can get other people in great physical shape, but for me, it takes that that mental strength to one continue to keep coming back. Right. And that's I'm trying to build from there. Yeah. Because I'm like, okay, for me, this is like. Personally, this is where I, I stand in my base of meditation and reconnection to myself, is yeah. physical activity. Putting myself in something that's an uncomfortable state and being able to overcome it yeah. with that 45. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and being in a place where it's still a team environment, I'm still around a, a collective people, a group of people in a community that are supporting me and that are, are giving me like so much praise in what I'm doing, but I'm not, at the same time, it's being reciprocated, but I'm still giving back. You know what yeah. I mean? Like it's, it's being appreciated. Um, and again, like I, I don't, even being an entrepreneur and, and where I'm at, it's been hard. Like it's been very hard. And you talk about humility. I literally had a conversation with my mentor yesterday and he said, I think you need to, you need to find that basic humility and you need to be vulnerable because mm. you're too strong. And yeah. I'm just like, what does that mean? Like, right. what do you mean vulnerable? Like I'm, my dumb ass looked up the, the definition was like, maybe this can give me some more clarification. <laughs> like, like, you're just, not making just, sense. Just yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Vulnerability, what does that mean? And I, I thought about it and I was like, okay, you know what, you're right. Hmm. But I'm constantly having to be strong for everybody else. And then when you yeah. have to do that, wow. it puts a lot of pressure and it puts a lot of weight on your shoulders to forget about yourself. Yeah, you know what I yeah. mean? Where yeah. you, like you said, it, it's hard when you have to look behind you and you're like, dang, I actually did come this far. And I never give myself enough credit for the things that I've done and been yeah. proud of myself. Yeah. X, Y, and Z, but yeah. I'm constantly having to keep go, 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 go. And when you have to do that, you forget about the balance and the base yeah. and, and the happiness and, and the purity of what you're doing because you're constantly trying to get better for everybody else or be yeah. better for everybody else. Yeah. And when it comes down to like building up that mental strength, I am still in the premise of trying to figure that out. I will never preach that. I know what I'm talking about when it comes down to mental health. Yeah. I look at it and I'm like, please teach me what you know. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm genuinely interested and I want to know because I'm in the place right now where I have a very high stressful position in my yeah. job. I do have a lot of people counting on me, so yeah. that puts a lot of pressure on me. Yeah. And there's times when I'll be good, 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 and all of a sudden it's when I crash. Yeah. Oh, I crash. I get that. <laughs> like, yeah, I get that. Yeah. I crash and I'll, yeah. I'll have like a, a moment of just like, 
a little break, a mini breakdown, and I'll cry. And I'm like, yeah. But I always feel really good after it because I'm like, yeah. okay, I just let it out yeah. because I hold it in so much. Yeah. But could you imagine if I understood how to balance that out and mm. I knew the steps for myself on what that yeah. took to be able to sustain that in a, in a good way and say, tell myself it's okay to not be okay. Yeah. Because I'm still trying to figure that out because people yeah. are counting on me to be at the top of my performance. People, are, mm. and it's always been that way from being an athlete. Yeah. To going into the entrepreneurial world, like. It's a lot of hard work. It is a grind. Yeah. It is, it's not easy. So yeah. Yeah. to be able to put yourself in that place and to be able to be vulnerable and say, I don't have it all figured out. I don't. Mm. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm in this fight every single day and waking up with an initial purpose because I do want what I have to be super successful. Sorry. <laughs> but um, I'm also trying to figure out how to say, okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm, that's powerful, Jess. Yeah. But for real. No. This was oh, yeah, about. about <laughs> no, <laughs> no, we got we got some glue in the back. So, something, that, something, that, and thank you. That's for, beautiful. Yeah, I remember first time we met, you'd opened up about that that journey, and it makes me think of. I, I love reading. I love reading philosophical books, spiritual books, and I remember a mentor of mine said this to me, kind of when I started my own mental health, and I love what you said about box. So even now, as I say mental health, I'm like, actually, it doesn't encompass yeah. fully the journey. But he said to me. The most difficult journey isn't the journey without, it's the journey within. Yeah. Because that, 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 is, that is the scariest place to go, that is the, um, that is the most difficult place because you, you face things that you didn't even know were there. You, you get these milestones as athletes, we're so goal oriented. That's what sets us apart. We are able to fragment, and the word fragmentation okay. comes to mind. We're able to f just fragment our performance and insulate ourselves from the outside world and say for the next week or the next for soccer 90 minutes for the next whatever our performance is everything else is out the window mm -hmm. and we were able to walk in and, and focus really that, that that's a such a unique thing that's that's towards athletics and now you bring some of that and it's, it's the drive it's what helps you as an entrepreneur to go further to, to get it quicker to to have such success I'm out of the gate and I'm just curious something that marked me in such a positive way is for for you guys and I guess even ask myself that is you know, being a woman in the entrepreneurial world yeah. being a man of color yeah. do you feel in what ways do you feel that that newness that rawness that pressure do you feel any of that mm. or is it still something it's, it's navigating where it started it was a, like a like inferior, honestly, mm -hmm. like it, it really was because I just didn't feel like I was up to the level that the people I was surrounding myself. Not granted, I put myself in that position because I was like, this is going to be tough. You know, yeah. I mean, you're not on the same level, but you know, you people tend to say like, hey, you know, surround yourself with the five people that you want to, you aspire to be. Yeah. And I spent a lot of time with my business partners, you know, and like I said, we we all they're they're at a level right now where one day I would love to reach, but they're years ahead of me, fucking years ahead of me, and. With the pressure of me trying to catch up to that, like we always talk about this, they have, they're running marathons right now at a nice good pace. They've already ran that marathon, they're at a, at a whole different level than I am. And I'm trying to sprint to get up there and catch up some type of way without making a new mistake. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it was, and it, to be the only woman in the room amongst people that are that established, like it's scary. Yeah. It's very intimidating, it's very scary. Um, but there's also a basic comfortability mm -hmm. because when I look around and I'm sitting in, in, at this table with, people who are so established, I have to remind myself like, okay, you're not there yet, but you're here now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, Look at where you're at now. Right. Like, you know what I mean? Like you gotta kind of have a little bit of pride on that because you, for me, especially being an athlete or even with my background, like I came from a single mom, like we didn't have yeah. zero. Like I've always had to kind of continue to put myself in position where survival was, like you're gonna figure it out yeah. no matter yeah. what. You yeah. know, you don't yeah. know the word can't. Like my mom always said, you don't know the word can't. Don't ever look, tell, let anybody tell you the definition of what that means because you don't know it. Yeah. Like stay blank to it. And that I kind of grew up with, just, and continuously kept putting in every perspective, whether it was with pageants I did or with going putting myself to general school or becoming a professional athlete to even the entrepreneurial world was, look, you know, it took a lot of work for you to get here. Now you're either gonna like, if, and it could take one small instance to completely take it away from you. And that is a scary feeling. But for me, I have to recognize where I'm currently sitting. And even though, like I said, the whole basic vulnerability, I am genuinely proud of myself. Yeah. Like, it, I have to awesome. constantly say that because being able to establish myself and, and to be in a place of where I feel inferior and that I have all these basic emotions, 
the one thing that's gonna over, that keep me going and that's gonna completely just shadow all that out is me being like my pride and then saying, you know what, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna fail at this, man. You put yourself here. Look at, look at, like you said, look, look back and look at everything that you've been able to do to get to this point. Now you can either take those steps back and be okay with what you did, or you can keep going, look back again and be like, dang, a year later, mm. we're still going and look how much further we've got. Mm. You know, you, <clears throat> you mentioned the seat at the table. I think that's really powerful yeah. because mm. it does honor that you're there. Mm and that there's a reason, there's blessing, there's favor, there's, yeah. there's everything that you need to be at that table right now. And I love that concept of I have everything that I need, I just yeah. need to continue to walk it out. Like I'm not, I'm not lacking anything, I have abundance. I think that that's just me knowing who I am spiritually, knowing yeah. who I am in the physical as well. And it's the yeah. same thing for you, Chas. It's really cool to hear that because I think there is this, I don't wanna say pressure, I think it sometimes is very healthy to be in the room with people that have established. I'm like, you're kind of, I'm trying to go there, right? Mm -hmm. I have vision, let me be around people that have already been there. But it sometimes can be uh, humbling to sit there and be like, well, I'm not there, but then it's also like have the gratitude of being there. It's like this, yeah. this weird, so yeah, it's yeah, like so yeah. many emotions. So many emotions. Yeah. Hence why the whole mental health question is real because you yeah, know, yeah. it's all over the page half the time. But I do think to, to answer your question, this idea of having a seat at the table, when you said that, that's the first thing I thought of. And I've had many conversations with some of my close buddies, like, you know what, I feel like I can get in any room and I yeah. feel like I have favor anywhere that I go, yeah. but I don't have a seat at the table. Mm. So it's this idea that they'll let me in the room and I can stand in the background and they'll point, oh, let's highlight him, but there's no seat at the table for me. Yeah, and I don't want to make that about color. Yeah. I, 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 I'm, I'm a firm believer that I am who I am for a purpose and yeah. I recognize that I'm a game changer. So any room that I go into, there's mm. a purpose yeah. in my melanin. There's a purpose in my smile. There's a purpose in the way that my hair is twisted yeah. and that it will impact and influence. Yeah. And that came from a young age. I went to a school that was predominantly white. There was five black people that graduated in my graduating class. I think we had like 750 wow. in my whole graduating class. So I've always understood that diversity one takes lots of lenses. There's a lot of ignorance with people yeah. understanding cultures, but I've always recognized that I've been a gap filler and I'm going to be me authentically. And I'm going to break some chains that you thought yeah. about who I'm supposed to be or what I'm supposed to sound like or what I'm supposed to yeah. look like. <laughs> and I'm going to show you what it is to be mm. a black man and be Melvin, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> so I would say the seat of the table has been the biggest uh, challenge that I have felt, but it's also taught me to come back to, and Jay, you actually the one that, that inspired this, was this idea of if you just give your best, stop focusing on what room you're in, stop focusing on who can do what for you, yeah. but start giving where you can give, regardless. Like be humble, serve where you can serve, give where you can give. I believe abundance starts to find you, and I feel like yeah. that's kind of the process that I'm in. Okay, even if it's making money, it's still serving. Like you said, it's just bringing you to a humility. Yeah. Like stepping into that humility, serving and doing your best at whatever that is, an opportunity will find you there. Yeah. And I feel like there's so many times in my life where I've tried to place myself somewhere and I really could, yeah. but it still wasn't to, it didn't get anywhere. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a plant with roots that aren't very deep. It's like, cool, I'm there, but it's like, okay, this ain't doing nothing for me. Check-ins and savings still looking real, <laughs> yeah. looking scant. Like, it's like, cool, I know everyone in the city, but what is that doing for me? Yeah. Let me get back to the basics, like we talked about before we started. Yeah. What am I here to do? I'm here to serve. I'm here to give. I'm here to love. And if I can do those things powerfully, then I know that abundance will find me in whatever that needs to look like. And so I'm yeah. truly walking that out, and I see it, so. Mm. There's, um, uh, have you guys Matthew McConaughey fans? Oh, yeah. He's all right. He's a teenager. He's all right. He's all right. Yeah. I'm an Aggie, just so you yeah. know. Oh, God. He's cool. Actually, I, I walked right into that. He's cool. I, you know, that was, I was like, ooh, He's all right. that just left my mouth. Right. But his, uh, I've been listening to his, his book, Green Lights. Oh, big fan. And I want to. Is that his oh, autobiography? You yeah. would love it. Just yeah, from what you just said, you would love I'll it. I'll read that. It's a, it's a different side of him. Yeah. That because I remember first coming across him in, in the rom com guy. Yeah. Yeah. You know the all, the bazillion rom com movies. Yeah. And never would take loving ha 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 ha. Yeah. But this really introspective part of him that you don't associate typically with mm -hmm. him. And there's a part of the book that I'm in that, that is really spoken to me as of late, and he talks about forced winters. Mm -hmm. And that this realization he had at a young age, that transition is hard. Life is good, but life is also hard. And it, these obstacles that were, are put in front of us to overcome, 
it forces us to go into places and to reach deeper and to think about things in a way and to walk into vulnerability. Yeah. It, it digs these things, it calls us to be this person and, and shed this person that can't move forward with us in the path that we've been called to. So I, I love that, of mm. what you talk about having favor. And also on the difficult side of favor is the imposter syndrome. Yeah. Come on. Oh man, especially not being an athlete yeah. anymore. <laughs> I know I, I struggle It'll with It'll get that. projected on you too. You'll be no. like, oh, wait up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Am I that? Yeah, like, yeah. Okay. Oh man, no, that I think was I am. no way. Yeah. The sense of imposter syndrome. So uh, with mental health, my fiance and I, we, that, that was one of the things, that was one of the values that really bonded us and it still is. And <clears throat> oh, it, it, as you take the journey, with it, there's so many different aspects of mental health. It's this big umbrella. Right. And now there's coaching, now there's therapy. Uh, gosh, we're doing premarital counseling. And just this commitment to the long journey of investing in yourself. And I'll never forget, I called my last game for the season, so please, I kind of want a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I called my last game on Wednesday. And, ra and there was this experience of rather than being like, Yes, there was this experience of like sadness. I, 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 I couldn't experience the glory of it um, because everything that I, the discipline of not engaging in, because I, back to being on the field, is I'm gonna hyper focus, I'm gonna lock in, and all these other things throughout the year, it all hit me all at once. And finally, it was waking up the next day of feeling, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm doing this thing. And it started with this ethos and message of in the midst of uncertainty, do something. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm you know, faith-wise and believer of like whatever your background is, but believing, for me, believing in a higher power. And I remember reading this, or listening to this podcast, and the author said, so many people come to this place and this crossroads and you're waiting for the magic sign, you're waiting for the lightning bolt, you're waiting for this thing. He said, do something. Mm -hmm. And you'll be amazed to see how, you know, whether you believe in God or the universe or nothing, you, you'll be amazed to see how the settings and the scene changes. Yeah. And this cooperation with this life that's waiting for you. Mm -hmm. And so that was really a foundational element for me. It was, do something. So the call for entrepreneurship, being an entrepreneur, you just don't sit on the balcony. You're like, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I came to this realization. This is awesome. Waiting for the big, waiting for the funding, the, you know, waiting right. for the accelerator to come. Right. Um, it's putting yourself, it's doing something, coming to a geekdom. It's meeting, you know, can't give Jay a shout out enough. I remember meeting Jay at a coffee shop and the big smile, you He's know, the but, realist. Boy. Yeah. But, but just meet, like it, it's saying yes to this project. It's, the next thing and, and the different things that move as we cooperate, the world moves around us. And gosh, some of the, some of the most incredible leaders, I, gosh, I think of people who have inspired me just way before the, the Nelson Mandela, seeing how he did something. He followed his passion and it was bathed in anger and resentment at what was happening with apartheid. But during his time in prison, he was given his time and he did something, he wrote. He took the journey in, and then when he got out, it changed the world as he knew it forever. And it just was so unique when I got to go to South Africa, and I'll never forget, it was this, this answer of forgiveness, and this message of forgiveness, that everyone thought that he was gonna come out. It was almost like the savior mentality of this guy, he's changed everything, and his message was kindness and forgiveness. And remember, there was resentment within his own family. It was his wife, I think his wife divorced him. I may have got that right, but his wife didn't want to be with him. Because it was like, whoa, what? This wasn't supposed, this, you should be this way. And it was, the, it was the time of taking the journey in that he took a chance of saying, wow, I've been given favor. Now what do I do with it? I'm gonna be bold and preach this message that you know, no one knew about when, when the cameras are off and what he was doing behind the scenes and it changed so many people's lives and being in a country and, and seeing the impact of that. And I think most importantly for me, I, I had a moment recently where one of the biggest yearnings in my life is having a voice and using my voice. Um, 
and being driven in the community. So there are three guys, two, three guys I grew up with in soccer. Um, one's from Houston, Texas. Another one's from um, knows Chuck Tichindu's yeah. Mo and um, Charlie Davies. So Boston, LA, Houston. And we all had intersections and known them for a long time. And I remember taking a break and turning on the TV and seeing all three guys in broadcasting. Two of them in Europe, one in London, one in Liverpool at Anfield, this historic, iconic stadium. And the other one in LA, and all three of them become these faces and these voices. And I, I remember texting them, thank you. Thank you for what you guys are doing. It, it motivates me to keep on the path. To, and that, there's a French word for it, it's called denouement, which is rest and reflect. My French is scratchy, so it might be a lot. But, but that, that right. word denouement, I've really come back to that of in the, as we move forward in the journey, that, that, that time for rest, that need for rest, to rest and reflect and really savor the morsel of the work that's being done. Really appreciate the career. Like I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh my gosh, I love that you told me that your story because now I'm gonna text your Dr. Christina Fink and say, oh my gosh, I totally connected with your story in a different way because I met Melvin. Yeah. Your story being on the LFL, I'm gonna reach out to Chuck and say, I met someone that knows your sister. but you sharing your story about being a woman as an entrepreneur, it, it makes me think of my fiance and what she tells me is being a, a woman in business. That's real. And, and the, the movement of empowering women. And, and it, it, just, it, it just motivates and inspires me to continue to share my story and be a part of like, this movement I feel like is happening. Yeah. Um, I feel like this is a microcosm of it. Right. I want to kind of come back to that question though, and we can move on because I really think that it's really powerful. I think Chess really like sent us into the stratosphere with that vulnerability and that realness. But I think it's so often in mental mindfulness or mental performance that everybody wants to be an authority and doesn't mm. speak from humility. And I think if we had more people speaking from humility, I think it actually would break the chains. So like for me, I want to speak to what I'm currently doing because I'm not an authority. It's just my story and I think my story is an answer for somebody. Mm. There's like three things that I literally do all the time. I talked about breath, which is really, really important to me. There's a song by Jonathan McReynolds called Breathe. And if I ever find myself like breathing up here and I'm not in the belly, I will put that song on and one of the lines it says is, it's a miracle to breathe. Mm. And that is the truth. And it just brings all of those walls down. Anything that I'm carrying, it's like, it is a miracle that I am alive. And I'm over here stressed about something I won't care about in a month, mm -hmm. like literally. So just breath work, deep belly breath work is really, really important. A thing that we use too much, and I feel like it can get siloed too, is this idea of gratitude. Yeah. Honestly, I think that that is one of the biggest go-tos. When I come back and not the gratitude of, man, I have this house, I have this life. I have... When I get back to, I have two eyes, I have my hands. I can walk out of this building. I am immensely blessed. Humble yourself. It brings me back to peace in my stomach. And then lastly, I would say is silence. In a world that is so loud and that wants to be loud, you talk about the, the struggles of being you know, a person of color in entrepreneurship. I think there's the other side where everybody wants to use it and wants yeah. to bolster it, wants it to be loud. And then don't look good and be chocolate too. It's like <laughs> everybody wants to put you somewhere. Yeah, and yeah. honestly, it's funny, but it's yeah. also very isolating and it, it plays into this trust issue of like, who's just consuming me, yeah. who's really here for me. Silence and solitude always brings me back to myself because mm -hmm. I am Melvin, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And there's so much loud noise everywhere. And when you silence that and you have to listen to yourself, one, it could be anxious, but two, it could be like so freeing. And it's like, wait a minute, I don't have anything that's inputting. I'm just here with my thoughts. And sometimes I just get back to breath because my thoughts can be anxious. It's like, well, let me breathe. But it's just the reality of like, Hey, if I have some silence and solitude, if I can move somewhere by myself and just be with Melvin because I can only control Melvin, it really helps with mental mindfulness. I think I have a business name for you, hmm. a coaching pastor. <laughs> you, <go. laughs> you definitely have a gift. It's mm. awesome. Yeah, so I think we're coming close to time. Appreciate all of y'all for opening up and sharing your, your thoughts. I think one, one thing to kind of close because we went all over the place was yeah. in, in good conversation is like, for the entrepreneurs and creatives that are listening to athletes, anybody looking at this weeks from now, like what's one takeaway from this conversation that you want to make sure sticks with them? Mm. Ooh, that's, that's a good. Not the doozy. <laughs> not finish this on the hard one. Yeah. Yeah, this is so meaty that I don't know if I could. I have, I'll, I'll kickstart. I love what you said about becoming. 
Mm. Um, that process, we are constantly becoming. I mean, I think that's how you said that. Yeah. Uh, that's such a reminder and just such a humble way mm. of looking at it. Of I'm not the finished product. And that is actually, there, there, that's, there's glory in that. That's beautiful. And so I think for me, it's that process. We are constantly becoming. And it, you talked about the, the pressure of once you step in and that temptation to, to say, I have become, oh crap, what's next? <laughs> Rather than I've become, and wow, I'm still on the journey of becoming. Yeah, so. that's good. That's, that's a fun one. That's, a, that's in, my, in my opinion, like the journeys, and people say this all the time, like, oh, like enjoy the, enjoy the process, enjoy the journey, like genuinely do that. Mm -hmm. Because that's, it's hard, yes, but it's, it's a lot of fun. And it's also a place where you kind of get to see your capabilities and what you're able to do in some of the most uncomfortable situations. Places where people won't, wouldn't dare to go, you've actually either gone through and made it out or you're currently going through it, like I said with myself, where, yeah. you know, I'm, people will look at me and they'll think, oh, she's got it all figured out. She's got her businesses running. All that's great. And that's the easy part. But the mental, the mental stable, the stability of, of being mentally okay is one of the hardest things to overcome. And even, like for me, some, somebody who's constantly having to be a rock, um, but it takes that base of vulnerability sometimes where you gotta you know, be a human and understand yep. like, hey, you may not have it all figured out. Yeah, you follow a process on a day to day and you may have perfected that process, but that next step is gonna be the scariest step and you know what that feels like. Yeah. And sometimes you fear it. And sometimes yeah. it, it takes a little bit more of you recognizing the type of person who you really are, not the type of person that people perceive you to be and just sitting within the base of silence. But for me, the one takeaway that I would give somebody is one, be okay to not be okay. That's, I like that. Um, but two, don't be afraid to ask for help because like, it's a long journey that you're gonna be going through, especially if you're trying to become an entrepreneur, trying to figure things out. But don't make the mistake of trying to do it alone. Mm -hmm. okay, yeah, I think I Piggyback on that with just humility. If we could take anything away, I feel like just sitting here, I feel my, my cup has been filled because there's yeah. been so much humility and vulnerability with like high capacity individuals, which is really cool. I think that that needs to be projected more. I think that too often we are hustle culture, be seen, how many followers do you have, throwing out quotes. I'm not hating on that, but at the end of the day, this is real. I mean, like whoever's projecting that, they're still going home to something. Yeah. You know, they're still going home with their thoughts. And I think if we could just humble the idea that maybe you have vision, maybe you even have something that's very successful. Where can you find the humble margin to continue to grow, but to t continue to serve? Yes. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, I just add one more thing, and both of you said two things: uh, the seat at the table. <laughs> yeah. You know that um, just the banner that we are flying, whether it's for our families, uh, to you know to put food on the table, to take care of kids and our relationships, except, but really the, the banner that we fly and how the more we lean into our stories, the more we continue to endure, and endurance can be taking a pause and saying, I'm not okay right now, I need to take a step back and reflect. That is still a sign of endurance because you're still committing because you believe in the story that you're moving towards, you do that. You, you quit when you don't believe anymore, but pausing and also what you had said of my story is, might be an answer for someone else. Mm -hmm. I think just, that it, it, it takes the ethereal being a part of something bigger and it, it humanizes it of, there are people who don't even know it yet. And I remember I always wrote this down and, and it, my best of times remember this, but that feeling of you know, you're a part of something bigger than yourself. And there's someone who, doesn't, who you haven't met yet, who doesn't know that needs you to keep going. Because mm -hmm. that version of you that's gonna arrive in that moment when you meet them, they're gonna say, thank you so much because you endured, because you chose to transition, because you stopped at that moment and moved from sport to entrepreneurship. Thank you, because of your story, it's made me a better person, it makes me believe, and then they get to pass that on and be the next Melvin, right. uh, Chastity, or Michael. And I'll, mm. I'll, I'll close out, I mean, with, with that by saying, and that ends up becoming your why, because it's mm. no longer for you anymore. Wow it's for others and, and the community. And that's initially what we're, what we're trying to do is we've already gone through it and we want to impact 
And when you get to that point where, yeah, you go through it, but when somebody tells you what you did just helped me and you don't even know it yet, that, that impact on yourself, that, that, that turns into your initial why, of why you do the things that you do and why you push yourself to want to be better every single day is no longer for you, it's for other people. Wow. That's legacy, baby. Yeah. <laughs> Wait a second, that's our band name. Legacy? Legacy. legacy. Oh, I've been sitting here, yeah. <laughs> that's the photo shoot name, up. Legacy. Boom. All this deep talk about, I'm just like, let's get yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, I know, yeah. Can we get some music? Oh, that's Lord, the for real. Are we done? Inspiration. Thank you, Evan. You said a lot of stuff, man. Really like, big. Ooh, I was just chuckling about that. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's the beauty of stuff like this.